All right. So here's the recording. Let me do a screen share. So today we're going to begin a new chapter. And that chapter is about the fundamentals of goal orientation. The moment we do this, I want to actually go out and open up the whiteboard. Make sure you're uh, sharing the whiteboard with me here. Okay. All right. So about the, the whiteboard, sorry, about the, uh, the goal oriented modeling. Now, let's, let's take a, a step back again to what we used to do before. Okay. So we had the system here. It's in the middle. All right. Uh, these are our actors. Okay. And then we decide what are the use cases. And with the use cases, we're actually saying what are the, um, the, the, the functionalities that are going to be offered by the system to these actors. All right. Now, remember, we had the requirements engineering triangle, OK? So here we have the, the needs, remember? And then in the second step, we have, can somebody remind me? The second layer, did you forget? So the letter F, features, yes, very good. And then finally, the software specification. All right, now this over here, that's in the middle, that's actually from the perspective of the system itself, okay? Or should I say from the perspective of the institution? What is the institution? It's the institution that holds all these people together, okay? All right, so these are the people that I have. This is the system that I'm gonna create for that institution. Could be a university, could be a hospital, could be anything, all right? I start to think of my actors and then I start to think about what does the system itself need to have, okay? What does the system itself need to have as in what is the needs of my institution, okay? Now, in order to figure out the needs of the institution, so you can think of it this way, let me just write it down. Now, the needs of the institution itself, there is no one singular voice that speaks on its behalf, okay? What, what is the case is that we have different individuals, okay? Each one of them have goals. We say we ha they have goals, okay? They have certain interests, okay? Let me just write this down. Some of these goals have relationships with each other, okay? So this is G1 and this is G2. This relation could be that there is a dependency, there could be a redundancy, there could be a conflict, there could be a realization relation, there could be so many things, okay? But what we wanna do is we wanna take all the goals that we have from here, those ones over there, and we wanna be able to consider all of them here at the bottom. We want to be able to consider all of them and see all the relationships between those different goals, all right? When I see all the differences between the different goals, this is where it gets distilled and I actually figure out my institution needs, okay? And when I figure out the needs, this is where I put it at the very top over here, at the very top of the pyramid, right? This is my age situation. This is the needs. And then with the needs, I start to begin to figure out the features. And then for the features, I figure out the software specifications, right? Now, it could be that I have a person who has a goal, but they themselves are not going to be interacting with the system. So they're not really an actor from that respect, okay? As in an actor from a use case diagram, yet at the same time, their, their goals in that institution does influence what is it that I offer to my, my, my other employees. For example, okay, let's just say I have an institution as such, all right? I have two people, okay? Here's a manager, here's a, an, an employee, all right? Now, the manager, we're gonna, we're gonna create a new system but it's for the system, for the employees to actually work with it, not necessarily the managers themselves, all right? So the vision was that the person who's gonna be 
interacting with the system is the employee, not the manager. Yet the manager might have a goal or two. With it, it actually affects the use cases that I'm actually offering the employee. Because remember, I said some of these goals could actually conflict. Okay, so goal that exists for that actor might result in this use case that the employee would have wanted not being able, not being uh, made available, okay? So for example, this use case could have been the employee's ability to view certain information, certain sensitive company sensitive information. Yet one of the goals of the manager is that the employees at a certain level should not be able to view that information, okay? And as such, the conflict that exists between those two goals would cause me to cancel out cancel out one of the use cases that I would have otherwise offered to that employee. Okay, does that make sense for everyone? Am I speaking too fast? Did I lose anybody? Guys, can I get some uh, positive enforcements here? <laughs> If you want me to explain again, I'm more than happy to explain again, okay? All right. Okay, so can you repeat? All right, so Ranim, we're beginning again here at, at, at the top here, okay? Uh, I want to, what's important for me here, okay? is that I want to be able to relate this chapter to what I've explained before and in previous chapters, okay? Because the first thing you're gonna say, what's the difference between a goal and a use case? What's the difference between a goal and a feature? Okay, there is a difference, okay? Now, like I said before, we begin with an institution that has certain actors, okay? Um, we wanna actually create a system. Now, when we create a system, when we create a system, we don't actually create the system for a particular actor, for a particular employee, for a particular individual who's gonna be dealing with the system. We're actually creating the system for the institution and we're offering it to our actors to be able to deal with that system, all right? Now, the individuals that I have in my institution, everybody has goals, all right? Those goals have relationships with each other. Like I said, some of these goals could make some uh, features or some use cases redundant, okay? For example, the manager wants a feature X and employee wants the feature, they're the same feature. There's no point in redoing the work again. So I noticed that some have dependency for each other, okay? In order to achieve goal number one, I have to achieve goal number two. Okay, some of them even have a conflict with each other. Okay, because remember this institution doesn't have one singular voice that speaks on its behalf. It's almost like what you see sometimes in countries, okay, where every country have so many voices and everybody have their own concerns and their own goals. And some of these goals are in line with each other. Some of these goals are in conflict with each other. Now the, the idea of a goal is not in itself a use case. Okay, it is something that pertains to an individual. Okay, and the goal affects the features that I'm gonna offer by that system. Now, it could be, like I was saying over here, it could be that in my institution, let me just erase this over here. In my institution, I have those two actors over here. Okay, I'm gonna bring in a system, I'm gonna build it, all right? I ask the employee, he says, I, I want those two features. This is what I like, okay? So this is use case number one. This is use case number two. Use case number two is all about being able to view certain sensitive information, okay? For example, uh, employee salaries, okay? Now, manager comes in, they have their own goals, okay? G1 and their G2. And one of these goals could be, we wanna maintain the privacy levels and that certain information should only be visible to certain people in the institution, okay? So goal, for example, two could be in conflict with goal two of the employee, okay? And with it, 
had I not had this conflict, I would have had this feature available to the employee, but now I'm gonna cancel that because it's conflicting with what the actor, the, the manager actually wanted. All right, although, although that software system that I'm gonna be building in the middle over here, we're not actually intended to be used directly by the manager. Okay, so the manager is not gonna actually sit down on the, in front of that piece of software and actually use it. Yet the manager has goals and they have intentions and their goals affect what is gonna be developed into that system. All right, despite them not using it, despite other people who are gonna be using it. Okay, so people who are gonna be using it, people who are not gonna be using it, as long as they're in the institution with respect to that system, they have their own goals. We have to figure out those relationships between those different goals. All right. Now, uh, uh, in an institution, let's go back again here. Okay. Before we even think of the system, there might be a dependency between certain individuals. All right. There's a dependency to achieve certain things. Okay, by the way, that was the case before computers were invented. Okay, employees depend on each other to do things. So there's a dependency, all right? And there's also what we call a rationale, you know, like a little bubble thing. You know, excuse my, my artistic skills are very, very bad, okay? So there is what's inside the mind of an actor. This is what we're doing in goal-oriented modeling, all right? So let me go, is, is, is this clear for everyone, guys? Huh? Okay, guys at home, is this clear? Okay, good. So now let me go back to the slides here. Do, 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 do. Okay, I want you to pay attention because we're going to be doing exercise this lecture, probably. <laughs> All right. So the purpose of this chapter, we will be, let me just go like this. Um, introducing the fundamentals of goal-oriented modeling, just like a lot of things that exist in the modeling world of software, uh, there is a lot of modeling brands, okay? So if you heard of the UML, the Unified Modeling Language, that's one brand of modeling. There used to be other modeling things that existed before. Some of them are still popular today. For example, the flowchart. You often see the flowchart. If you Google flowchart right now and just click on images, you'll see a lot of different diagrams that exist with a flowchart notation that actually uh, is not part of the UML, okay? So we're gonna look at the basics of those modeling techniques through and and or graphs first. And then we'll look at one of the most popular frameworks for goal-oriented modeling, that's I-STAR. Now the motivation, actually we're gonna be doing more than just I-STAR. We're gonna be looking at I-STAR. Another one is gonna call, is called Kaos. Now I-STAR and Kaos are kind of like the iPhone and the Samsung of the, uh, the goal-oriented modeling market. All right, so the reason why we do Goal-oriented modeling is we want to facilitate the common understanding of the system. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we know that before. We're going to support requirements elicitation with goals. Okay, so when we are deciding on these use cases, all right, remember in use case modeling, we kept asking, we looked at the actors and we just said, this actor, what does that actor want? Well, we never actually considered what happens if that actor has actually a conflict with another actor. Well, we're helping those goals drive the use case that we're gonna be creating at the end, maybe some of them uh, end up being irrelevant. Um, we write down justification for our requirements. It's a proof of completeness. Goals tend to have greater stability than requirements. So even the features might self, they self change. Chances are the goals tend to remain the same. So a goal for a company or a goal for a higher level exec could be that we wanna maintain say the highest reputation, the highest customer satisfaction, okay? So if I'm an airline company, I want to maintain the five-star standard, right? That people view my airline as this is the top of the line, all right? And this is the luxury airline that actually exists. Now, the term goal means that it's an intention with regard to objectives, properties, uh, or use of the system, 
okay? And I, this is actually repeating what I just said before. I'd rather do this visually than I do this on, on uh, uh, you know, uh, by reading those slides. But one of the things about goals is that they can actually be subdivided into sub goals. So we begin with higher level goals. And you guessed it, the higher level goals tend to be a lot more stable than the lower level goals that could be um, a little bit more or less, less stable, more volatile, okay? So the most basic way we'll break down relationships between goals is through some sort of a hierarchy tree. It's almost like feature diagrams. Remember feature diagrams, we broke down the system, the, the product into features. Now we're gonna break, break down the goals into sub goals through an and or an or decomposition and obviously means that everything underneath my goal has to be satisfied. So if G is broken down to G1, 2, 3, 4 until N, I have to satisfy all of them. And when I satisfy all of them that I can have say at this point that I've satisfied my goal. The or relationship is obvious also as well. It's not an exclusive or just a regular or. In other words, if I do just one, one or more, then I would have satisfied the parent goal, okay, if I have G1, G2, G3 as a, my sub goals, I all I have to do is just satisfy one of them. And as long as I've done one of those, then I would have satisfied my parent goal, all right? Some dependencies can exist between those goals. The most obvious one is the required. And the required is actually kind of like the include, all right? So I say G1 requires G2 means that there's no way I can satisfy G1 without satisfying G2. All right, so it's a hard dependency. All right, for example, G1 could be that the system shall be able to navigate a driver through traffic, traffic congestion. G2 is the system shall be able to receive traffic messages. All right, now, if I'm not able to tr receive traffic messages, there's no way I can figure out what, where is it congested, where it's not congested. So there's no way I can offer G1 without offering G2, all right? Um, G1, another dependence called support. It says G1 supports G2 if the satisfaction of G1 contributes to the satisfaction of G2. Now you can think of it as support is kind of like the, the more lenient cousin of require, okay? So when G1 supports G2, okay? That doesn't mean that without G1, we can never have G2. Okay, we can still do it. But with G1 being available, it helps us because it supports and it helps us to offer G2, okay? It, for example, does some part of the functionality for us, okay? So the navigation system shall be able to download electronic maps on demand. G2 says that the system shall be able to, allow, so shall allow simple entry into the destination the destination for navigation. Now, I could have, in other words, I could have done G2, all right, in a different way had G1 not been available. But now with G1 being available, you know, it made my life a little bit easier. So the fact that I'm able to download maps on demand, now I can do a simple entry and can just figure it out on its own, all right? It's actually sort of like what we have with Google Maps nowadays. All right, next up we have obstruction. G1 obstructs G2 if satisfying of G1 hinders the satisfaction. Now we're talking about the negative side of things. Okay, so it supports and requires within the positive side. Require was a hard positive, whereas the support was a soft positive. Obstruction is sort of like a soft, a soft negative. Okay, now what that means is if G1 obstructs G2, that means if G1 is there, it doesn't really help my cause with G2. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that I cannot offer G2. It just, I wish G1 wasn't there. Okay, so it obstructs it, okay? And again, there's an example that you can see at the bottom. You can read that at your own time. Just like there is a soft negative, there's also a hard negative with the conflict relationship. So the conflict relationship basically says, if I have G1, then I cannot have G2. because straight up conflicts with it, okay? And if I have G2, basically that also means I cannot have G1. So you can have either or, it's an exclusive or relationship. And again, there's an example here for, for example, G1 says it shall be possible to localize 
the car via GPS. And now another goal is I want to be able to observe and respect the country's privacy laws. Now, it could be that the country's privacy laws prohibits us from being able to localize, pinpoint on a map a, a certain person's car. So if you want to adhere to the laws, then you can't have G1. If you're doing G1, then you can't adhere to the laws, right? So either or, it's a hard negative. Next up, we have something called a goal equivalence. Okay, now it could mean I'm having two different goals, but sort of like the work that I'm gonna do to, to satisfy one, is basically the same work that I'm gonna be doing to satisfy the other one, all right? So the system shall comply with the car safety regulations of country A. Another goal would be the system shall comply with the car safety regulations of country B. And it could be that the car safety regulations of country A is exactly the same as country B, all right? So you do one, you do the other one, okay? So a lot of countries, they have, uh, say, common traffic systems, all right? And uh, by, by, by such that if you get a driver's license in one country, you automatically get it in a different country as well, all right? So if I have a system that I'm gonna create to test a candidate for a driver's license, I could have just created the same exact system and I give it to the two different countries okay? because they have the same laws here and there. All right. All right. So uh, context changes and affects goal dependencies. Okay. So a change of a data protection law might prohibit the electronic localization of a car. Um, oops. Stakeholders must be aware of such changes and constantly analyze their influences. Now, what this means is, let's step out here for a second, go back again to here. So the context this thing is referring to is the outside world over here. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry, sorry. Is this outside world over here. And why is this thing not drawn? Okay, there we go. So this is the context of my institution, okay? If something changes outside, that might affect my people inside. Their goals may change. And when the goals change, the dependency between the different goals may also change as well. Okay, so this is what that one slide is actually referring to. Going back again here. I wanna be able to document these goals, all right, just like anything we keep telling you from the beginning of your degree, document, 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 all right? There's certain templates that exist for it. I'm not gonna go through the specific of it, but obviously you have to have a unique identifier for each goal. You write down certain management attributes, um, basically relative information that you have about that goal. When you document goals, just like you're documenting really anything, there's seven rules that should apply to anything that you actually document in the world of software engineering, which is be concise, use an active voice, document the intention, decompose it if there needs to be, what is the value, the business value, what is the reason why we have that goal, and avoid any necessary, unnecessary restrictions, okay? Uh, restrictions tends to be our worst enemy, and, and we like to have everything loose on its own, okay? So we have... Uh, the highest level of flexibility when it comes to development and we have the highest level of flexibility when we come to reuse at a later stage. Applying these rules already we're during, we applied it during requirements solicitation to avoid the elicitation of inappropriate requirements. All right, so now to the interesting part, okay? When it comes to writing down the goals, uh, just like with use case modeling, just like with system context modeling, having the ability to model, okay, the visual aspect of picture is worth a thousand words. And just like I can do that with function requirements and so on, I can actually do that with goals as well. Um, it helps create a common understanding. There is very common um, goal modeling languages like the goal oriented, Requirements language, GRL. Okay, let me just actually put up the uh, the pointer here. 
Okay, so we got the GRL. Another one is the I star and couch. So GRL tend to, what was kind of like the one of the more original ones, right? It got replaced a little later on with I star and couch. Okay, so couch and I star are more of the uh, the uh, what's it called the um, the Samsung and the iPhone now of the market when it comes to goal oriented modeling languages. Okay, now a language is something, a methodology is something else. Okay, so it's kind of like the difference that you've seen in your labs in your requirements engineering lab. So right, right now in your requirements engineering labs, we're teaching you the language. In the design course, we're gonna be teaching you how to design. So I'm gonna teach you the methodology, okay? The reason you're taking it, the language is in the lab right now so that you're ready when I get to teach you next semester software design, right? So with GRL, GRL, there's multiple methodology like for example gb ram jdc i star has something called the i star framework cows has the cows framework and there's other frameworks that exist the non-functional requirements framework nfr so many of them exist we'll focus in this we'll focus in 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 this uh uh course on i star and cows being in the more popular ones but we'll begin actually with the more basic types of uh breaking down our modeling just by regular and and or graphs okay so and and or graphs are there themselves not a notation that actually existed or they're formalized but they have the basic notion that other modeling languages uh, depend upon okay so you have the and and or trees we already understand what they mean the one thing that you should be aware of that the and and or graph should not be cyclic they have to be acyclic so the tree breaks down to the bottom but we never go back up again and we circulate because right then we have a circular dependence and that's definitely not good all right we can add the requires conflict we can add any sort of relationship we want the or decomposition you can see it as a straight line as such obviously because you see this is a very basic notation right and satisfying goal two that means i would have satisfied the root if i satisfied goals 2.1 that means i satisfied goal two which means i set aside the go the end decomposition you see a hard angle 90 degree okay so i gotta do go one two and m in order to satisfy the root and in order to satisfy the m i have to satisfy m1 and mj m i m sorry m1 and mj in order to satisfy m and everything in between all right then i can combine an n and or tree okay so at the top part i have the end at the bottom i have the or all right it can get bigger and bigger and bigger all right, and this is where I can start to add the different types of relationships. For example, this is a conflict. Okay, by the way, this is not a standard notation. It's, not, it's nothing official about this. You can create any notation you want. This is the require. Okay, so that, that means that this particular goal would require this one. This one and that one have a conflict with each other. All right. Now, Moving on to the more common one, the more um, popular one, we'll begin with the I star framework. Okay, it's based on GRL, so you get evolved from the GRL. It's also dependent on the idea of having and and or trees. We're going to model constructs for quality aspects. We have three things we have objects, dependencies, and relationships. All right, now these are the objects. With the object, I have an actor, and sometime I want to have the rationale of the actor. So, you know that bubble that shows right next to the cartoon that says, this is what I'm thinking, all right? Think of this, if I actually complete that circle, let me just do a pen over here. That little circle, let me just go like this, dash line like that. Like you can think of this area over here as uh, what this actor is actually thinking, all right? So this is very similar to what we see in cartoons where you have that little bubble that shows next to the head of the cartoon figure and it's kind of like, oh, this is what the cartoon figure is thinking about, okay? Then we have four things. We have a goal, a task. So a goal, we already defined what that is. It's my intention. A task, something I will have to do. A resource is something I can give or get. It's a thing. All right, now it doesn't have to be a physical thing, could be even a conceptual thing. For example, I wanna get an appointment from you. So an appointment is conceptual. I wanna get a bank account. 
A bank account is also conceptual. It doesn't have to be something physical, all right? And I also, there is the last part is called the soft goal. So soft goal is also the same idea as a goal. The only difference between a soft goal and a goal is that a goal, there's a black and white indicator whether I've achieved it or not, okay? For example, my goal was to be to, you know, sell 500 phones, okay? 501, I've achieved it. 499, I haven't achieved it, okay? A soft goal is one of those I know I want, but I can't put a number on it, okay? For example, I want to get excellent customer satisfaction. It's hard to put a number on, okay? Yet sometimes we can still create some sort of a metric, like so I want to get more than four on average, a four out of five, okay? Um, but yeah, in general, sometimes soft goals, This the meaning of it is that there's no particular metric that can let me decide whether I've achieved it or not. I know I want it. I know there's things I want to do in order to achieve it, but not necessarily I can measure have I achieved it or not, okay? And hence, this is why you get bombarded with service and service and service and service because they want to keep, oh, because they, they can't measure it, okay? Now, notice that these four things, all right, goal, tasks, these four objects, okay? Between an actor and another actor, there could be a dependency, okay? There's this thing here, one of these objects that one actor wants from the other one, okay? So one actor could depend on another actor in order to actually achieve a goal. One actor to depend on another to achieve a, a soft goal or to get a resource or to perform a particular task. That's in addition to, notice this, the goals that's in the mind and the, the brain of a particular actor. We'll look at this in a moment, okay? So we have dependencies and the dependencies you can see here in the middle, it's the same four notations between those two, okay? Those two columns over here. All right. All right. Now on this side would be actor one. And on this side would be actor two. And the, the proper notation for it would be, I'll put down the actor as a circle. Okay. And then I have a line with the letter D. Okay. And then in the middle, I put whatever object that I wanted from here in the middle. Okay. For example, let's just say we have a task. So this is my task. Okay. That means that actor one depends on actor two in order to perform that particular task. How do I know what is the direction of the dependency? It's a really the silliest thing that you can possibly think of but it's actually depending on the direction of the letter D in the arrow, okay? So if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give a highlight. So this letter over here, this over here, okay? That's actually the letter D, which, which actually you see at the bottom over there. All right? And as such, you're reading it. Oh, what's going on? Um, I think it's just freezing here on me in a second. It, it looks like it doesn't like the highlighter. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let me push back into the pen again. So, okay, so you can see that letter D is actually pointing into this direction. Okay, it's pointing into this direction, which means that actor two would have wanted something from actor one, it depends on actor one for that. All right, dependencies is one type, oh. Dependencies is one type of relationship. The other type is links, okay? And with the links, yeah, I feel like it's just freezing on me for a second. With the links, we have three different types of links. The first of which is called the means to an end. The second one is task decomposition. And the last is a contribution link and ignore the fact that it shows a little box so it's actually a negative sign, okay? 
So we have two types of link uh, contribution links. We have a positive one and we have a negative one. So we'll actually we'll begin first with those, those links. Okay, again, all of this I've explained a moment ago. Now, the first relationship that I'm gonna look at is the means to an end. Now, the words means to an end means al um, الغاية. Okay, means go one in order to achieve it. I have to do and achieve soft, the soft goal that you see at the bottom. I have to perform task one. I have to have available a resource. Okay. So those are the things, those are the, my means. Okay. And the end, the end that I want to achieve is the goal that you see at the top. Okay. It's almost to think about it as, you want to make uh, a certain dish, okay? Uh, chicken parmesan or whatever. You need certain. You need the you need the chef. You need the oven or uh, whatever it is. So you need the actual ingredients, uh, chicken, the cheese, or whatever it is that you you're gonna be using. All right. These are means to the end. The end is having the dish completed. Okay. Now, it's not all functionalities. Okay. It's not all functionality. It could be resources. It could be tasks, and it could also be the fact that if I try to achieve a different goal before that. So my work in achieving that soft goal that you see at the bottom helped me achieve my other goal. Okay, we actually saw this a moment ago with the with the um, was it the support and the require. Okay, next up we have the contribution links. Okay, contribution links, if you compare that to means to an end, they're, they're, they're like the hinders or sort of the obstructs and the supports, okay? Whereas being there or not being there doesn't mean a particular goal or soft goal would not be actually, it just, it's a contribution, whether it could contribute to it negatively or can contribute to it positively. Okay, so let's just take a look. This is soft goal number one. This is soft goal number two. Okay, so soft goal number two contributes positively to soft goal number one. That doesn't mean that I cannot have soft goal number one if I didn't have soft goal number two. But now that is there, thank God that is there. So uh, it's helping me achieve soft goal number one. Same thing with the task that I see over here, the fact that is there, it helped me. Now. Unfortunately, this soft goal, when I'm trying to achieve it, and again, ignore that negative, that box thing, I don't know why it's there, a negative sign. The soft goal, when it's there, trying to achieve that soft goal actually impacts me negatively in trying to achieve soft goal number one, okay? And by, by chance as well, this task, task two, when I'm doing it, it's actually negatively affecting soft goal number three. Now, if you think about it, task number two in an indirect way is actually helping soft goal number one because it's attacking my enemy, so to speak. Okay, you get that guys? Okay, you can see how task number two is actually helping soft goal number one because it's attacking what is actually attacking soft goal number one, okay? Now, all of these are contribution links. None of them is a hard relationship, okay? They're all hind either hinders or supports, hinders or supports. There's no require or conflict, okay? Next up is a, a something called the task decomposition. The task decomposition is it shows us the letter T, okay? And task decomposition only happens if the, the node is a task and then the things underneath it is the actual things that I'm gonna break this task into, okay? So I'm gonna break this task into task number one. I'm gonna use task number, uh, sorry, resource three, goal two, and I'm trying to achieve soft goal number three, okay? Think about it as it's very similar to means to an end, 
Now, the reason we like to call that the task decomposition is because the goal is never the task. The goal is the goal. A task is something that I would do to achieve the goal, okay? So a task, I could break it down, right? Whereas a goal is something I'm trying to achieve. As you can see, the arrow is going up, trying to achieve this higher level goal, okay, the of Sami. All right. Whereas the task is not in itself the goal, it's a task. I do it. All right. I end up sometimes breaking it down into different things. All right. Now we have two different kinds of goal models. The first of which is called the strategic dependency model. Um, the strategic dependency model, it shows dependence between the actors and what they actually need from each other. The second one is, oh, I sorry, I flipped it. it's called the strategic rational model. Now let's go back again. So this is the strategic dependency model. Now you can see that the actors, they don't have that little bubble that comes with it. We're going to see that bubble thing in a moment. All right. So the strategic dependency model shows a whole bunch of dependencies. All right, and this is my actor one, this is my actor two, and these are what are the things that they depend on each other for, okay? So when I'm reading this, it, I'm reading it, okay, remember, see, you can see the arrow is going this way, the letter D is going this way, the letter D is going that way. Now, the only the last one is actually going the other way. Uh, let me read it again. So a car driver depends on the automotive manufacturer in order to avoid accident in order to cover a particular distance by getting the car, in order to get the resource that is the actual car. The manufacturer is looking for the car driver in order to achieve the high driver satisfaction. It actually needs people to give them that. I'm happy, okay? They cannot do it by themselves, okay? BMW, Mercedes, they can't do it. They have to get people to say, we're happy with your product. They, they can't just claim it on our behalf. Okay, so this is called the strategic dependency model diagram. The strategic rational model is the same thing as the strategic dependency diagram, except for now the word rational comes in. Now the word rational means is the reason behind something. And when I want to figure out why is it that that person is doing something, I'm trying to go into their head, the little bubble that shows next to their head. And I'm trying to figure out the rationale, okay? The reason behind it, okay? And as you'll see in the next slides, that little bubble is gonna pop up over here, okay? Now, before I go into this, okay? You can see, first of all, we got the same two actors, huh? Now, in this particular diagram, just if I look at this little middle part over here, we have dissected one particular dependency. That actually existed over here. It's the avoiding accidents thing, okay? Now, with the dependency, I'm gonna zoom in a little further. And this is the brain, this over here is the brain of the automotive active, automotive manufacturer. This over here is the brain, the rationale of the driver, all right? So if we read this, the driver depends on the automotive manufacturer to avoid accident. But now let's dive into the brains of these two entities, okay? Everyone has a goal, remember? Not necessarily that these goals are in line with each other. Some of them also have dependence on each other. But let's 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 break it down here for a moment. Okay. Fine. All right. From the automotive manufacturer's perspective, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be constructing safe cars. Okay, because that contributes positively to my soft goal of achieving an excellent brand reputation all right it's a soft goal because i can't put a number on it okay this task i'm going to break down into three things first of which i want to have the soft goal of low cost development again 
we don't have a particular number, the lower the better, okay? I wanna have the goal of reducing injury to people. Maybe I can produce a number for that, reducing the number of accidents. And again, I can put a number of that. In order to reduce the injury to people, I have to perform the task of protecting persons involved in the accident. And in order to uh, um, reduce the number of accidents, I have to compensate for driver mistakes. I have to inform the driver about possible collision. This is the way I'm reading it. It's very easy. And I notice that when I'm doing those two tasks over here, they happen to negatively, let's put the, the, the negative sign here, negatively impact my soft goal of low development cost because naturally, naturally, the more features I'm gonna develop in order to compensate for driver mistakes, in order to uh, 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 inform the driver about possible collision, that means I have to put extra work to enable and to create and deploy these features and test these features and so on. And when I do this, this is gonna increase my cost. Okay, so you can see that even certain goals within the mind of one entity, there's already conflict that can happen in between, okay? So I take all of this into consideration when I figure out finally what is the use case that this one actor actually wants, okay? Now, to make matters even more complicated, there is a dependency between them, all right? Now, the dependency between them, well, let's take a look at the driver. The driver also have a state of mind. They have a rationale. Let's read it, okay? Uh, I want to drive from A to B safely. This is my task, okay? Now, I have certain things I want to do. I want to have an accident-free driving. I want to be... I want to have protection against the threat of life or physical condition, okay? And I also have that nice soft goal of trying to enjoy my driving, to get some pleasure into my driving, right? Let's take down this route over here, all right? So accident-free driving, in order to do that, I got to obey The speeding limits, I, I just had a freeze in my mind. <laughs> okay, I have to obey the freezing limit. Uh, sorry, the speeding limit, okay? Obeying the speeding limit, obviously, negatively impacts driving fast. And driving fast is one thing that I see that gives me pleasure, okay? There's a positive contribution link over here, which means, which means obeying the speeding limit does it by relation, positively affect driving with pleasure or no? No, right? So two negatives make a positive, but a negative and a positive keeps it as a negative, all right? So the negative, if I have a negative here, and then I have a whole bunch of positive afterwards, whoops, then that negative, if affects everything in a bad way from that point on, okay? If I have two negatives after each other, all right, then actually that negative possibly affects what comes afterward because it's sort of like you're attacking my enemy sort of thing, all right? And then you can extrapolate, oh, what if I have three negatives and blah, 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 it's just more of the same. Just keep thinking it's more and more and more and more of the same. All right, so we'll stop here. Um, let me just end the lecture here. So guys, any, any questions about this before I stop? Don't go away because I, I wanna tell you something after the lecture, it's not related to the course material. An advice that I want to give to you about social engineering. Okay, type. Let me let me stop the recording.